Uh, last week we almost finished, I think, the what we should have finished textually, uh, but there are some things at the end of chapter 1 I want to go back to uh, to finish that up. And I'm probably just going to tell you up front now, I, don't, I think I'm going to get behind tonight and we'll try to make, we'll, we'll make that up from week to week. So uh, turn to Colossians chapter 1. So we're looking at Colossians and um, I mean I've taught this before, taught it in, in university settings and I've taught it in the canonical order as the books occur in our Bibles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon. And um, but this time after study, and, and this we can't be certain about this, but it, I mean, all these are joined together because Paul's in prison. And uh, Ephesians doesn't seem to be dealing with a specific problem. It seems more of a general letter. Colossians is dealing with an occasion. It's dealing with problems. So did he write Ephesians first? Did he write Colossians? They're all written real close together. Now, some people, you know, and we'll talk more about this when we get to Philippians, some people say, you know, Philippians is, is a little bit later. But uh, we know for sure Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon are written real close together. Now, what's first, Ephesians or Colossians? And I've decided to go with Colossians because it seems Paul's in prison. He receives a visitor, Epaphras, and Epaphras tells him about some problems that are going on in a couple of churches, uh, Colossae, Herapolis, and Laodicea. And so Paul writes Colossians to deal with that. And we don't, again, we don't know for sure. Some suggest then he takes that basic outline and then expands it in Ephesians. Now some people argue it's the other way. He wrote this, this book of Ephesians and then he hears about the problems and so he takes material from Ephesians and writes Colossians to deal with that. So there's really no way of knowing, but I've decided to look at Colossians first and then we'll look at Philemon, and then we'll go to Ephesians, and then the last Philippians. So uh, any, any questions, comments on the background or anything we looked at last week? So what is the problem in Colossae? Well, again, it appears we, what we have is like one side of a phone conversation, and we have Paul dealing with the problem. And so from what we have of Paul dealing with the problem, we have to try to piece together what is the problem. And from Colossians, there, there is a problem. Uh, he's emphasizing Christ, and Christ is, is complete, and he's God. And if you're in Christ, then you're complete. Uh, and then he talks about don't let anybody deceive you. Don't let anybody lead you astray. And, um, and especially in chapter 2, he says in verse 8 that we'll look at tonight, uh, philosophy and empty deception according to human tradition. So that's, that's part of the problem. Um, then more specifically in chapter 2, he says in verse 16, don't let anyone act as your judge in regard to food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. What does that sound like? Jewish, yeah. Um, and then in verse 18, about uh, don't let anyone defraud you by delighting in humility and worship of the angels or talking about visions that they've had. So verses like that help us to see that's part of the, that's part of the problem that he's dealing with. And uh, it appears to be a Jewish problem, but also it appears to be a, um, I guess we've heard Gnosticism, how are y'all? Uh, we've you've heard of Gnosticism, and so it's Gnosticism becomes a full-blown problem later on, and so we might call this incipient or pre-Gnosticism. I'll get you a syllabus later at, at the break. Um, basically, the only thing that's on it is the outline of where we're supposed to be tonight and where we're supposed to be in the future. So, um, so basically, what what is the answer to the problem? the false teaching at Colossae? Well, it's Christ, and, and he's exalting Christ. And he says, the, the key verses of Colossians are 2, 
chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. For in him, in the him there is Christ, because of the last uh, word in verse 8, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Why does he need to emphasize that? It seems because they were saying that all the fullness of deity did not dwell in Christ in bodily form. And that's, that's a form of later Gnostic teaching or pre-Gnosticism as well. The word uh, Gnostic uh, comes from the Greek word gnosis. And a Gnostic is G-N-O-S-T-I-C. And the Greek word for, for uh, to know, K-N-O-W, is G-N-O-S-I-S, Gnosis. And so the Gnostics said they were the knowers. Now, full-blown Gnosticism has, you know, a lot, maybe some different things, but their basic Gnosticism said there's dualism between matter and spirit, and spirit is better, matter is evil, um, and it said that Christ, that God could not be in Jesus in human flesh because human flesh is sinful. God can't dwell in human flesh. John is dealing with these problems in his letters, uh, 1 John especially, uh, and then the others to some extent. Um, and so Christ, Christ wasn't fully God, but... So you have all these angels leading up to God, and they did say Christ is at the top of the ladder. So Christ, Paul says, no, in Him all the fullness of deity dwells, and that, that's a present tense in Greek, and that means it's a continuing process in bodily form. And in Him then, and so... Another mark of Gnosticism, they're the knowers. And again, John is playing on this a lot in 1 John. We know that we have eternal life. We know that Christ came in the flesh. We know this. John is saying, we're the knowers. Because Gnostics would say, we're the knowers. If, if you can be just a regular Christian, they'd say, but we can give you some inside information. We can give you, we can give you mysteries. And you can, uh, you can have this, this inside information and you can, um, you, you'll be able to, to grow more. That's what they were saying. And Paul says, no, if you're in him, verse 10, you have been made complete. And he's the head over every ruler and authority. So the basic heresy is saying that Christ is not enough. And Paul says, Christ is enough. If you are in Him, Christ is enough. So Christ is the answer to the, to the heresy. And um, that play on mystery, I mean, he mentions mystery a couple of times as well. There were mystery religions in the first century in Paul's time in Greco-Roman world. Um, just like today, um, there's not much concern or respect for maybe uh, old things or traditional things. People want to hear new. And in Paul's time, the old traditional religions w w didn't draw a lot of people. I mean, they were there and people would say, yeah, we still worship all the gods of Rome. But what captured them were these mystery religions. And there, a lot of Paul's letters have a background in that. They're almost like, it, it's not just, okay, well, they're going to, to some worship gathering. That became your family. And there, there are writings like if someone's spouse died, the fellow members of the mystery religion would provide meals and they would even take care of you know, a, a person. Say a, a woman's husband died. Uh, the mystery religion would just basically take care of, of that widow. Um, and it offered something that was meaningful to people. And um, we don't have all the information what went on in the mystery religions. There is a work, you can find this on the internet, I'm sure. It's written by um, 
I don't know if I can spell his name, Apuleus, A-P-U-L-E-A-U-S or something. But the name of it is the Golden Donkey. And it's dated around Paul's time, maybe a little later. But he said, he, he wrote this work and he said, I tried all these mystery religions. And he talk, starts naming and he tells what happened in different ones. And um, it, it's a story. So he has a girlfriend and um, he's traveling around all these mystery religions. And I, he makes his girlfriend mad or something. She turns out to be a witch and so she changes him into a donkey. And then he searches all over and finally he's able to turn back into a human. That's what the story's about. But uh, it's based in, in some of the things that would go on. And he talks about like you get into a pit and they slaughter a bull over your head and blood covers you and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Paul, maybe with that background, Paul is saying Christ, the, the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, all these people coming in here and telling you you don't know anything. You know something. You're complete in Christ. And he's over every, every ruler and authority. And the mystery, what God hasn't revealed, is now revealed that Christ is the hope of glory. All right. Uh, comments, questions on any of that before we look at the latter part of chapter 1. Okay, well, so again, this is um, uh, open floor. If you want to say something, you want to ask something, you want to disagree, uh, that's fine too. Uh, just feel free. If I'm talking, just uh, interrupt me or say, hey, I got this to say. Um, in chapter 1, <clears throat> we looked at, he's showing that Christ is incomparable. And he is the, verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And we were talking, I think, about that when we stopped last week. There are some religious groups and, and teachers, and it's very ancient, who say that firstborn of all creation means that he is the first one that was created. Um. In, in context, before we even talk about what the phrase means, in context, especially the next verse, can that be true? That Christ is a created being? He's the firstborn of all created. How much was created? All things. All things are, are, did he create himself? Which is ludicrous. So he didn't exist, and he created himself. He, even by the context, um, that it, it's not saying that he is a created being. And, and in uh, Psalm 89 and verse 27, um, <clears throat> well, let's go back there and read that again. Psalm 89, 27. Somebody read that for us, please. And I'll make him the firstborn the highest. <clears throat> All right, who's that about? Verse 3 of that psalm. <clears throat> I'm not just asking you, sir. And who is that chosen one? Yeah, my servant David. He's talking about David. And he says that... in. In verse 27, I will make him my firstborn. David wasn't the firstborn of his family. He was the youngest of his family. And there in Hebrew, uh, this poetry, and the main component of Hebrew poetry is not rhyme. It's parallel lines. C.S. Lewis in one of his books on the Psalms said, this talks about how brilliant that is because if the main component, I mean, like, main component of English poetry, and, and I'm certainly not an expert in this, and I don't have much of a background in poetry or English poetry, but it's, it's rhyme, and so you're going to translate that to another language. That's very difficult because you have to find now 
two words that mean, that translating the words that you have, that also rhyme in, in that language. So C.S. Lewis says it's brilliant because the, the main component of Hebrew poetry is parallel lines, and you can bring that over into any language, not the rhyme. So verse 27, I'll make him my firstborn. And uh, there are various types of parallelism, Hebrew parallelism. Some is um, it's antithetic or it's contrasting. The second line is contrasting. It's saying do this, not this, but this. You have all this in like Proverbs and Psalms. Um, another type is, um, is uh, synthetic or um, where it's saying the same thing in different words or it may be even advancing the thought. So I'll make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So if we understand Hebrew poetry, what does firstborn mean there? If the second line is related to the first line, Firstborn means highest of the kings of the earth. So it's a place of, of preeminence. So we'll go back now to Colossians 1. And such a reading of firstborn makes perfect sense there. A reading of firstborn here, firstborn of all creation, that he's a created being makes no sense. But by the next verse, because in, by him all things were created. And then if we understand Hebrew poetry and the parallelism, then firstborn of all creation means preeminent. He is the, he is the preeminent one. Thoughts, comments on that? And then he goes on to say how that <clears throat> he created everything <coughs> and he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, and then verse 18, the firstborn from the dead. The preeminent one or the one who is, you have first fruits a lot of times as well. First fruits, he doesn't use first fruits here, but it's, it's showing that there is a future harvest. And so, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's the meaning of those statements in verse 18. Uh, verse 18. All right, skip down to uh, verse 24, and Paul says here, as an apostle, he is entrusted by God with an obligation to proclaim the mystery of Christ to all people. That includes Gentiles. So that all people might be united and brought to maturity in Christ. That's the goal. And toward that end, Paul works tirelessly. He labors and he suffers extensively. The mystery is now revealed. That's what mystery means in the Greek New Testament. Something that was, was not known and God reveals it. It's, it's not like watching a, reading a mystery novel or watching a mystery on TV. Oh, I knew it was going to be him. You get to the end of it. God, I thought that's how it'd be. I figured that out. This is God. You would not know unless God revealed it in its entirety. And so Paul says he is suffering because of that. Uh, somebody want to read one twenty four. Colossians one twenty four. Okay, what's the difficulty of that verse? <clears throat> yeah, and Paul says he's going to fill that up. How, how, what, what's your thoughts? What, how might we understand this? If Christ suffered to get you know, to establish the message of salvation, that he is relying on source of it all and, and propagating that to uh, humankind. 
and his, and which is his body, the church, which is his body. Why, why can Paul not mean, even from Colossians, why can Paul not mean that there is something lacking in the suffering of Christ? In the suffering of Christ and what he did on the cross. Why can he not mean that? Yeah, that'd be given in to the false teachers, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and so they would say, well, that's what we've been saying. We, we agree. So it, it's a difficult statement here, but um, he's not talking about the afflictions of the historical Christ in his suffering and that there's something, something lacking in that but the afflictions of Christ in his body, which is the church, and part of which Paul fills up in his own flesh. And so Paul filling up or completing Christ's trials means he does his part in my flesh, he says, as a fellow member of God's covenant people in enduring the trials, the suffering, that's brought about because his work is to, to um, teach and to spread this, this mystery. And um, even uh, Acts 9 verse 16, when uh, Christ tells Paul, what Saul at that point, what he will do and what, what, what he set him apart to do, he says that I'll show you how much he must suffer for my sake. And so Paul is basically saying, that's what I'm doing. I'm suffering for Christ's sake. So he's, he's not saying that Christ didn't offer enough. He didn't do enough. He's saying, that's Acts 9, 16. He is saying that <clears throat> in Christ's body, the church, I'm doing my part to spread this news. Any thoughts on that or Comments? It just makes you wonder if that suffering ended with Paul or if that's been ongoing throughout the ages and suffering. Or is there still something lacking that um, in getting that message out to the world? I think it's a good question. It's a good thought question. And um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, there's a song we sing, Christ has no hands but my, our, our hands, and he has no feet but our feet. And, and that's true, isn't it? I mean, he is, um, I mean, God is sovereign, and so God can accomplish his, his will. But God has chosen to work uh, through humans. I mean, Christ chose the apostles, and <clears throat> I mean, none of us are perfect, but, you know, we might say, I could have chosen a better group than that group, and, and, and you know, the way they, they are, but that's, and it's almost the idea, too, like Paul says in Corinthians, that he chooses weak people and, and weak things to magnify his glory, and he's done that. He's done, he did that throughout the Hebrew Bible, so... I would, I would kind of lean toward that uh, this is still continuing. Um, and, I mean, if we live for Christ in this world, Jesus says, uh, you will suffer. We don't go out and look for suffering. That's just, that just comes. I'm, uh, in, in the years following the New Testament, there, uh, the persecution from the Roman authorities, there's, there's no evidence much in the New Testament that that, is a is a serious problem during those times. And it's isolated, like during Peter's in 64 when Rome burns, but it's not widespread throughout the whole Roman Empire. I mean, first of all, the Roman Empire looked at Jews and Christians the same. Most of the, I mean, from the book of Acts, where is the suffering that the church and the persecution the church experiences? Where, what's the source of that? Jewish, Jewish people, yeah. Paul's appealing to Rome. I mean, Rome, Rome steps in and rescues Paul. So you have that, <clears throat> and then, you know, there was rumors from your neighbors and different things. The, there's evidence that 
you know, maybe fellow Romans might say, I don't know about them, you know, that you heard about that group, the Christians? And I, they spread rumors that they were uh, cannibals because they said they, they talk about eating the bread or eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus. They said they were guilty of incest because they talk about loving each other and they call each other brother and sister. And some might say that, and they did say this, that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't involved in, in the fire in Rome because they talk about how the world's going to be burned up. So you have those rumors, which is not government-led persecution. But, you know, with Revelation, again, I don't want to get into a debate, you know, when you date Revelation, I'd probably date it 90 to 100, but that becomes almost government-led. But it's still not widespread. It's in certain places. <clears throat> but following the years in the New Testament, um, Christians were persecuted by the government, and there, there were martyrs. And martyrs, uh, I mean, for somebody, you heard of Polycarp, I guess, a disciple of John, the apostle, and he was, what, 86, I think? And um, they were burning him at the stake, and they said, all you have to do is renounce Christ. And he said, for 86 years, he's not turned on back on me and I won't turn on him and so he died um, but there came to be great respect and, and that's right you know respect for for Christians who would die for their faith and so they were admired but then it it came to be more than just respect and admiration that it almost turned into a cult and so you had a cult of the martyrs and some uh, they would go and take the Lord's Supper on the graves of the martyrs and then you wanted to have a bone or a, you know, a relic of a martyr. That's why throughout churches throughout the world, yeah, they'll say, well, we have this about John the Baptist or we have this of this person. Somebody said if you added up all the supposedly remains or bones of John the Baptist, you'd have like you know, 50 John the Baptist that you could, <laughs> could build. But martyrs became uh, almost worshipped. And then people thought, I mean, what's probably easier, just dying an instant for your faith or living a long life of faithfulness? What do you think? I mean, so I guess it would be a, your opinion, but what do you think would be easier? Well, I, I kind of look at Peter. He was ready in a moment to die right then. Throw out his sword, that would have been the end of it. Yeah. And, and as our lives, I mean, what's easier, a little uh, sprint uh, or, you know, dash or a long marathon? It's that, and, and our Christian lives are up and down. And so we're not always on a, on a mountaintop. Uh, you know, there are times we are discouraged and we are depressed and we have evidence in Scripture of that. So it's up and down, but it's that persistence So keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keeping our eyes on the goal, running the race that's set before us. Well, some Christians said, it'd be easier for me if I could just die right now. Mm -hmm. And so they would go out, they admired the martyrs, and so they would go out and try to become martyrs. And they would run up to Roman soldiers and say, we're Christians, kill us. And the soldiers got sick of it, and they said, just leave us alone. You go jump off of a cliff or something if you want to. And so um, there's suffering that is a part of, of living the Christian life. And we don't go looking for it or try, you know, to cause problems with it. I mean, we're to, as far as lies with us, we're to live peaceful lives with everyone. But Christ is countercultural, and so... Problems come up. And suffering, you know, suffering can be relative. There are relative degrees of it. I mean, right now in our nation, it's not illegal to meet together to have a Bible study. It, it might get to where it's illegal, but right now it's not. In some places throughout the world it is. But do you think uh, maybe, do you think it never happens like a Christian is passed over for the job promotion because they're a Christian? You think that's going to go down in the paperwork why they didn't get that job? That's not going to go down. 
And so there, there is that suffering uh, in living for Christ. So I would, I would say it still continues. Any other thoughts or, on that? Yeah. Yep. But then he goes on to say, well, the suffering in this life is going to pale in comparison. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and, and I don't think, I mean, some people uh, and some Christians suffer extraordinary suffering. He's not really talking about that. He's just talking about the suffering for living for Christ in this world. And so he can write, we can write over this life suffering but he says the life to come is glory we write that and as you said he, he says it's not even worthy to be compared for that but <clears throat> that's that's something we have to know and we have to keep telling ourselves if we're in the middle of that suffering I mean for somebody to say well, it's not even worthy to be compared to glory that's been revealed you know well are you going through what I'm going through so, but uh, Paul, Paul suffered a lot. You know, I don't, I don't even know whether we have all that he went through in the New Testament. And he talks about, you know, he s- suffered from people in churches and he suffered from others. And so, all right, let's uh, continue on at the end of chapter one. So, I made a minister, verse 25, of this church according to the commission from God granted to me for your benefit and I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which had been hidden from past ages and generations but now has been revealed to his saints. So Paul's work is to reveal that to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is. The mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, from the last two verses, how hard does Paul labor for that? Yeah. And th- there's a paradox that's here, and we'll see this paradox also in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. I don't, I don't want to go over there right now. We'll study it when we get to Philippians, but we know the verse... Uh, Philippians 2, uh, 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But verse 13 says, because God is at work within you. It's a package. Those two go together. <clears throat> we work out, and work out means bring to its complete end. We work out our salvation because God is at work in us. And so here there's the, that same paradox Verse 28, he's working all this in verse 29. For this I labor, striving, and it's according to his power, which works mightily within me. So who's working, God or, or Paul? Both. Both, that's right. He's laboring <clears throat> and striving. And, the, and these are strong words in the Greek. It means um, if you... Um, and some of you may have done this today, but if you like do uh, work out in the yard or do some physical work or something, you ever been just so tired you just you can't just do anything else, and you just go in and you just you know just sit down. You're just that tired. Struggling. Yeah, struggling. Just oh, I don't even feel like eating. I'm just gonna feel like going to bed. Just never been that tired. <laughs> never been too tired to eat. <laughs> This is, Paul, it's working to the point of exhaustion, <clears throat> striving, struggling. But it, notice, it's according to His power, which works mightily within me. So God is working in Him. And the goal is, verse 28, and I would say this is, uh, <clears throat> this is the goal of, of history. This is... Uh, <clears throat> the word for uh, last last things is eschaton, and you probably heard the phrase eschatology. Eschatology, E-S. 
I didn't do too well in spelling in school either. It's like spelling, but E S C H uh, A T O L O G Y or something. Eschatol. <clears throat> and I'm not going to write it up there because when I start writing, then I get worse at spelling. <laughs> um, eschatology is the study of the last things. And so <clears throat> the goal of eschatology is that Christ will be all in all and we proclaim Him, admonishing every person, teaching every person with all wisdom, so we may present every person complete in Christ. Now, is that universalism? Universalism says that all people are eventually going to be saved. Is that what Paul's saying? Does Paul ever teach that there are going to be people that will not be saved? Yeah, very clearly. And the wrath of God comes upon such people as that. So this is uh, uh, there's a difference between prescriptive and descriptive. Prescriptive is the, what you hope to happen, what the goal is. And so prescriptive is, and the goal, and the goal for Paul, and the goal for the church today should be to present every person complete in Christ. Not, not just every person of a particular congregation, every person in, in the world to present every person complete in Christ. Now, uh, will that be true? No, because it, it doesn't lie in God's power. It lies in the, the response to that word. It, it lies really, in, like Jesus says, in what kind of soil you are. So, but the goal is, the goal's not a small goal, is it? That present every person complete in Christ. So what does he do? We proclaim Christ, admonishing every person, teaching every person. Okay, thoughts, comments on chapter 1 or, or questions. I'm seeing where we are on time. Okay, let's move into chapter 2. And uh, if you have a syllabus, the, the, this might be prescriptive and not descriptive as well. The goal which will not be reached probably tonight and on February the 8th, is Colossians 2, verse 6 through 3, 4. And that's assuming that we got through 2, verse 1 through 5 last week, and we didn't. So uh, we're going to pick up with uh, 2, 1, there's 2, 1 through 5, that's the section, and then the next section is 6 through 15. And I'm anticipating that, I mean, that, that's a theologically heavyweight, rich passage what Christ has done. So I'm anticipating we probably won't get much further than that. But 2, 1 through 5 is a, is a section, but it's a part of a bigger section back there in 1, 24, that what Paul is doing. Um, yet there is, a, there is a shift that's here because he's, he's talked about his own apostolic ministry and now he, he shifts to the effect of, effects of that so, do we have somebody who will read 2, 1 through 5? <clears throat> so, I want you to know how great a struggle I have with you and those in the way I receive it. And for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to, teach, uh, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. There are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. But though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see you in good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Okay, thank you. So Here's the effect he want the effect on on them. Now he didn't establish his congregation. Epaphras apparently did, and Epaphras brings the news to Paul while he's in prison. There are some problems, and Paul writes this letter, sends it by Tychicus, and uh, he says uh, in there at the chapter four, there's mention of a letter to Laodicea, <clears throat> which uh, 
we don't have. Some suggest Ephesians is that letter, but uh, it d doesn't seem to fit in. But um, he says, I want you to know how great this, this struggle is. So he's repeating that struggle, and he uses the same language, some of the same words in the struggle. It's, um, we get our word agony from that. And um, he, he uh, highlights to them how great that struggle is in this whole region for these people that he's never met face to face. And um, he, Paul's struggles were, were due to a lot of different uh, circumstances around his ministry and churches. But the focus here would be, I think, uh, the struggle against opponents to what Paul preaches in the Christ-centered gospel. And so he's already anticipating the opponents in, in Colossae who are trying to deceive them. And he says, don't let them deceive you. Though he's never met these folks, these Christians, face to face. <clears throat> and so he says that your hearts, heart in, in the New Testament has the same ideas in the Hebrew Bible. It's not, um, it's not primarily the emotions. That, that's a part of it because we're whole beings, but it's primarily the will and the mind and the thinking. Um, next, next Wednesday is Valentine's Day. It's Wednesday, it's Valentine's Day. And you have, you know, Valentine cards. I love you with all my heart and all that. Um, Hebrew people and Greek people uh, would say, I love you. Well, Hebrew people would say, I love you with all my kidneys. Um, that was the seat of the emotions. Um, <clears throat> and so heart was not the idea of the emotions. It was the... The, the, in, in New Testament, you have the, the you know the idea of bowels, the bowels of mercy. So, he says that your your thinking, your will, that you may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and that you would attain to the the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. That's that. Maybe he's playing on this Gnosticism thing. You can have this assurance, this full assurance. That results in a true knowledge of God's mystery. That is Christ himself. So you have a couple of terms there. Again, is, is, is he directing this to pre-Gnosticism? They might have been throwing these terms around. But he says that you can have this full assurance of the true knowledge of God's mystery. And what is God's mystery? It's Christ. Yeah. It's Christ himself. Um, and I'm struggling on your behalf for that, that your hearts may be knit together because his goal, again, is to present every person complete in Christ. And it's for their encouragement. And then he talks about Christ in verse 3. Now, he's already said some great things about Christ in chapter 1, hadn't he? So, in whom, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I'm saying this so no one will deceive you. So, Christ is, is the, the mystery. Um, In the book of Proverbs, and also when Daniel, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar receives that uh, dream, or he has that dream and he can't interpret it, you have these words, mystery and knowledge and all of that. So that seems to be a background to this. Uh, look uh, at Proverbs chapter 2. And verses 3. And following Proverbs 2. And in the early chapters of Proverbs, you have context where uh, the writer is saying, Wisdom is a, is a woman crying out. And you need to listen to her. She's crying out in public places. Listen to her. Now the contrast it, it, it to that is the strange woman or the harlot. She's also crying out in public places. <clears throat> so he says, 
Listen to wisdom. So verse 3 of chapter 2 of Proverbs, If you cry out for insight, raise your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. So you have here hidden treasures, you have knowledge, and this idea of um, understanding and how it takes seeking this. I mean, if somebody t told me, uh, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, you probably know him, that we, we bought uh, our house from uh, four or five years ago, I guess. But, uh, and I'm still... I don't know him well, but, you know, we're kind of Facebook friends. But um, if uh, he sent me a message and said, and I don't know why he'd do this, but if he said, I, you know, I buried some treasure in the backyard, <laughs> I'm probably going to rent a backhoe or get somebody out there and dig the whole yard up to find that if you knew it was there. And so he says, you, if you search for, as, as somebody searching for silver in this understanding. So let's go back down to Colossians. This is in Daniel 2 as well. The combination of this mystery, hidden wisdom, and understanding. And so we may be alluding to all of that. But all of that is summed up in verse 3, in Christ. Because in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You have access to that. It's been revealed. Paul's a minister to, re to reveal that. All right, so verse 4, I say this, and that's a little bit difficult. He, is that what he's already said? Or what he's, the, the, the whole book up to this point? Or what's following? But I say this, I'm giving you all this information about Christ as the, um, all wisdom dwells in him. So, nobody will deceive you with, um, George, you read that, didn't you? you? You said plausible, I think. Yeah. With plausible. So, it's, it's something that on the surface could lead you astray. It's not implausible. It's... It's translated various ways, persuasiveness of speech, enticing words. Sometimes the word is used in a courtroom where a lawyer is trying to persuade toward an unjust verdict. But it, it's uh, one commentator said it's close to the phrase of uh, to talk somebody into, into something. Don't let them talk you into this. That they deceive you with these persuasive arguments. So, they're, so they're, they're persuasive, but don't be persuaded. Don't, don't fall to that. And then in verse 5, he says, um, one reason you shouldn't be persuaded is, even though I'm not there with you physically, I'm with you in, in spirit. And he's actually writing this letter to them. And he says, I'm rejoicing to see, and by this it means he's heard this from Epaphras, your, um, this translation has orderly manner. What, what other translations do you have from verse 5? Do they have anything different? Good order, good discipline. It's um, toxi taxis or toxis is the Greek word, and it means order. A taxidermy, derma skin, tax tox is to order it. So um, taxidermist orders the skin. So toxis is to be in order. It's the same word that would be used um, when he talks about relations of husbands and wives and masters and slaves, parents, children, that there's an order. So um, he says, I rejoice to hear of your orderly, your ordered, and um, the opposite of this would be something that would be unruly. It's, the opposite of this is used in 2 Thessalonians 3, 
verses 6, 7, and 11, where he, he uh, there's the alarm. I guess I need to finish that sentence, don't I? Where, where he says, you, you need to tell those people not to be unruly, uh, and, and some need to go back to work in the church at Thessalonica. So it's, it's an idea of your discipline, your orderly manner of living for Christ and the stability of your faith in Christ. Well, if their faith is so secure, why does Paul need to write this letter to them? That's right. It's the same idea of like when he tells the Corinthians, if you think you stand, take heed lest you, you fall. Um, like Pete, somebody brought up Peter when uh, Jesus said that um, all the apostles would deny him, what did Peter say? Yeah, they might, but I won't. I never will. And it's that, that pride uh, that Satan is always lurking around, and he's, he's looking for that. So <clears throat> their faith is stable. They have the stability of faith. But they need to hear this letter. They need to be warned. We need to see. I had a teacher. Um, I learned a lot from him and spent a lot of time with him before he, in later years. He's since uh, gone on. But uh, he said, um, one can never learn the gospel enough. One can never hear the gospel too much. And so... <clears throat> we need to constantly hear the supremacy, the primacy of Christ and what he did. And even though we may think, okay, well, I'm, I'm a biblical scholar. You know, take heed lest you fall. Um, there has to be humility with that. But it's all looking to Christ. All right, we're going to take a break. Comments, questions that you need to say before we take a break? Okay, the next section is a very theologically significant section. And um, this and the verses that fall to the end of the chapter are really the heart of the letter. And um, back in chapter 1, he says in verse 10 that um, his goal or his prayer for them is that they walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, uh, again, I don't, you know, you might have seen it on the news, a judge somewhere around pretty close, and, and we don't need his name, but he uh, was uh, caught using money that he shouldn't be using and not acting as a judge should act. So he wasn't living a life that's worthy of a judge, of the status that he had. So Paul, is, he's not saying we live lives that, or that we earn our, our salvation or that, that we're worthy of this because we're not. Christ died because we're not worthy. But we're to live lives that are in harmony with that, worthy of this gospel. And he says the same thing in Ephesians 4.1. So back in chapter 2, uh, all of this that follows is, is related to that to be complete in Christ, to have this good discipline, to walk worthy. And uh, he uses, in verses 6 and 7, some participles here. He begins with agricultural, but um, and then he goes to like a building, some building pictures. But it's modifying this idea of walking. So verse 6, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That's just the same as live a life that's worthy of the Lord. Walk in Him. Having been firmly rooted, that's agriculture, agricultural, and now being built up and established in, in your faith. And how do they walk worthy? How do we walk worthy? Well, verse 7, by being established in the faith as we were instructed and overflowing with gratitude, and keeping our eyes on Jesus and that no one would take us captive through philosophy and empty deception. So we're, to, again, it's the preeminence of Christ. And so 
All of this has to do with the practical application of walking in Christ. Not in other ways. Not according to philosophy or empty deception or that's in accord with the human tradition. Um, and he says then, you don't, uh, you receive Christ Jesus as Lord or the Lord in verse 6. Christ Jesus is not merely a name without any kind of interpretive significance. What's the background of Christ? Yeah, the anointed one. Christos means anointed one in Greek. Uh, Mashiach in Hebrew or Messiah. It's the, Christos is a translation of Mashiach. So Christ is a translation of Messiah. And so the whole Hebrew Bible is looking to the coming of the Messiah. And the Messiah has come, and it's in this man, Jesus. So Jesus is the Christ. I know today we have, you know, people will use Jesus Christ as a, as a proper name. It's, it's originally saying the man, Jesus, is the Christ. The man, Jesus, is the Messiah. And then in verse 6, he's also Lord. Um, he is... And that's not just a, a term of, of respect. It uh, is the translation of the term Yahweh in the Hebrew. And so Jesus, this man, Jesus, is the Messiah, and he's, he is equivalent with Yahweh, or the Lord, in the Hebrew. He is the absolute ruler, and, it, and it's the... It's the equivalent of Kyrios. It's what pagans would call their gods. Kyrios, or Lord. Well, they're not gods. Jesus, the Messiah, in whom all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, He is the Lord. And so live your life in light of that. So walk in Him in a manner that's, that's worthy of of him. It's a it's a in chapter four, verse six, it is uh, we're to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. So live your life. And the outsiders at least would include the the false teachers. You walk in wisdom, how you can escape them. All right. Um, thoughts on, on six and seven. Primarily, but there may be a Jewish, some Jewish. So, so uh, could it be said that this would be Jesus Christ, the I Am? Um, that's not what translation says, but. Uh, okay. um, so, so that would, even though it could be Lord, uh, Yahweh, that's not the same as saying I Am. Yeah, every, well, I Am is built on, or, or Yahweh, God's personal name, <clears throat> is built on Eya, which means I which is I am. It's a verb for being. I am or I will be or who I am. So um, Yahweh, the Hebrew Yahweh, is built on that. Um, and there is that connection. And there, there is, you know, for Jesus said, before Abraham, I am. Mm -hmm. There is that connection as well. But whether that's intended or whether the hearers are intended to get that, we can't be exactly sure always. But it, it, it is equivalent with the I am, certainly. But would they appreciate that? That's what I'm sure, that's what I'm getting at. So there would be no, be no point in saying <coughs> the I am because that would not necessarily mean anything to them. But it would mean something to Jewish Christian or to Gentile Christians who had who had studied the Hebrew Bible in the Septuagint or the Greek translation, and you have Kyrios, which translates Yahweh. So, so but but in Hebrew, Yahweh is is not always I am. I mean, in in the burning bush episode, God says when He says, "Whom shall I t say sent me?" He says, "Tell them I am." Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Tell them I am sent you. Yahweh is built on that root. <clears throat> it, it is the personal name of God. And it 
has that background in I am and has his background in God's mighty acts, especially what he did in Exodus. <clears throat> so that yeah, that's a good question. Um, so they're to be they're having been firmly rooted, that um, the tense of that in Greek is perfect. You remember the force of the perfect tense? I'm not calling you out by name. <clears throat> perfect means it's something that happened in the past that stays in effect to the present. Yeah, the effects still continue. Uh, Jesus cries out on the cross and the perfect tense is, is finished to Telestai. It is finished in the past. He's not still finishing it. He finished it. The work they came do. But the effects of that still continue. The effects continue. Um, and so you have been firmly rooted. That happened at conversion. You're firmly rooted. And the effects of that still continue. Um, then he says, you are um, continuing, that's present tense, of being built up and established in the faith. So you, you're, it's like you were planted and you have to, if you still use agricultural pictures, you're, you planted, firmly planted something, but if you don't water it, if you don't put it out, if you don't take care of it, if you don't put it out in the sun, it's not going to live. Just because you plant, I planted that. <clears throat> Usually, I mean, Carrie does well, but in, in my experience, when I've tried to raise some sort of a plant, it doesn't last very long. Um, and uh, in Hawaii, somebody in the church there gave me a couple of plants of like, uh, what was it like? Uh, yeah. And you know, she said, you can grow these. You can come out and you can cook with them and all that stuff. You know, it, it died. And then she said, oh, you let them die. And I said, I didn't like, you know, I didn't kill them. I just tried to. So she gave, gave me another set of them and uh, died. So... Um, but you have to take care of plants. So that, that may be the, the part of this. But the idea, too, is he's switching into another metaphor of architectural. You have built up and, and established. And this development. And this architectural metaphor may mean something. One commentator, uh, he makes a pretty persuasive case, I think, is going, he talks about how that, Christ, since Christ is all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, um, in Old Testament times, in Hebrew times, where did God dwell figuratively? In the tabernacle and in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. And so now in G Jesus, who is the Christ, who is Lord, all the fullness of deity <clears throat> continues to dwell. And so it's almost the idea he is the new temple. And if we are in him, <clears throat> then we are part of that, that new temple. Now that's already, this, this already happened because we're in him, but we're looking for the time when all things will be made new. He'll return again and... Uh, our earthly bodies will be changed to resurrection bodies. So maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. So he sa says you have to continue, verse <clears throat> 7. And you see to it <clears throat> that no one takes you captive. You be on the lookout for this. You, you can't be taken captive. By this teaching. This teaching is in contrast to what they have received, which is Christ. And he, he's not against philosophy, so I can't ever take a philosophy class because Paul, no, that's not what he's saying. Um, philosophy, this, this philosophy is equivalent to empty deception. And it's based on the traditions of. Humans, not on the Word of God. Um, 
It's not based on Christ. That's what makes this empty. And so this is what they're pushing and not Christ. And he says, in Christ is all the fullness of deity, and in him you are complete. Don't be taken captive by this. The, the point was say, I guess, you know, if you, if you study philosophy or you study anything else, we need to study it through the lens of Christ. We need to study it through the lens of, of Scripture. So all of, of knowledge, I mean, true knowledge is found in God. And so all of knowledge has to be seen through that. I mean, I don't think you can come to true science unless you, unless you believe what Scripture says. Scripture's not a science book, but you come with presuppositions. If you don't believe what Scripture says on the very first page of Scripture, what you're going to come to a conclusion if you, and you look at science. You're not going to come to that, are you? In the beginning, God created. You're not going to come to that. And then you come up with all these crazy ideas. So, again, the Bible's not a scientific textbook. And we've got to be careful you know, and respect the different types of literature that's there. And some of it's poetry. But we, we can't really know science. You can't really study any area of knowledge unless it, it is through the lens of, of Christ. So they're trying to take you captive by this philosophy and this empty deceit. Don't, don't let that, that happen, these traditions of, of men. Um, questions, comments? So we looked at verses 9 and 10, and I think this is the key. I don't think I said alarms. We could just go till midnight. And nobody would say anything. <laughs> Are we going to stop? <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> if we go to midnight, we'll have to get through that 8 o'clock alarm. So verses 9 and 10, which... Um, are uh, the key verses, I think, in Colossians. And verse 9, notice it begins with, what's the first word you have in your translation? Four. four. What does four mean? Hence. Hence or here's a reason for something, yeah. Um, it's a reason for what I've said. Now, the reason is now giving uh, given what the philosophy lacks, and that is it's not based on Christ. So posit in a positive way, walk in Christ. That's verse 6. And be captivated by Christ rather than be captivated by this, this philosophy, which is empty deceit. And again, that has to do, it's implied again, is this is how we're walking worthy <clears throat> in a worthy way. And uh, the main reason this, this philosophy is deficient and why believers shouldn't walk in it is it's not according to Christ. And what does he tell us about Christ? He tells us about Christ. All the fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. Uh, let's go back to Psalm 68. <clears throat> Verses 16 and 17. Psalm 68. Verse 16. Why do you look with envy, you mountains of many peaks? At the mountain God has desired as his dwelling. Indeed, the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. So, God was well pleased to dwell in Zion and He will dwell there forever. It is His holy place or in, in holiness. And some suggest that might be in Paul's mind. Paul's Jewish. 
doesn't always have to say, okay, well, I'm quoting this or I'm alluding to this. All of that, and, and Paul knew, Paul knew the Hebrew Scriptures. I mean, what kind of training does he have in the Hebrew Scriptures? University training. Yeah, university training, high level of training. Um, <clears throat> Paul's highly educated, and so he knows that, and his thought patterns are in those, in, 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 in the Hebrew Scriptures. <clears throat> That's why, I mean, Paul's Jewish. He's very Jewish. Yet he writes these letters. As somebody said, the only thing Greek about the New Testament is, is the language. You have this Jewish background. It's Hebrew background. Jesus is Hebrew. He's Jewish. You have all those Hebrew ideas that are, that are there. So, um, God, the... the with that background, I mean, he doesn't say, okay, this is what I'm looking at or this is the background to it, but some have suggested Psalm 67 is the background to this. And so now you have God's holy dwelling, his holy of holies, and it is Christ. In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It's almost like he is the new temple and the holy of holies. And it, uh, a deity means um, the fullness of God. He is, he is God. Divine fullness. Not just part of divine fullness. It's complete union between uh, God and Christ because Christ is God. And we have the idea, you know, in the Old Testament of God's glory filling the temple. God's glory has... It dwells, and that's present tense, in bodily form as Paul writes this. Not just, it not used to dwell in bodily form, but as Paul writes this, God's full, full, the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Um, in, I mean, who is Christ? Well, he's fully God. He's God. He's fully human. He's not part human, not part God. Fully God, fully human. And people have debated that, and theologians um, all through the years, but he's fully God, he's fully human. <clears throat> and it appears, again, this is directed at that pre-Gnosticism and the false teachers there because of their low view of the body. And so the result of that then in verse 10, in him you've been made complete. You've been made full. You, you have this, this fullness. And so what do you need? Do you need some secret philosophy for somebody to tell you the, the mysteries? You don't, you don't need that. You have been made complete in him. All right, thoughts on those two verses. All right, we're probably going to spend the rest of our time <clears throat> here talking about um, these next ideas. Um, <clears throat> and all this is related because in him all the fullness of, of deity dwells and he is head over every ruler and authority. He doesn't just say over good rulers and authority, but over every ruler and authority. And then you skip down to uh, verse 15. He disarmed... Who, who did he disarm from verse 15? Rulers, rulers and authority, authorities. And how did he do that? He triumphed over them through the cross, through, through, his, through his death. And so <clears throat> all this, again, is, is related, and it's maybe related to the idea he's the true temple of God, and there's salvation in him, of course. And he is over every head and ruler and authority. He's already talked about the you know, firstborn of creation. He's preeminent. Uh, he has supremacy. And he now is head. Head means um, the one who has authority. But also it can mean source. And whether Paul means that here, I don't, I don't know. 
Um, all right. Um, verse 11, then, and, and in him you were also, I'm going to just read through verse 15. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. What thoughts or questions do you have on that before we dive into it or observations? Yes. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, I'm trying to look for my specific notes. I got to do better at marking my notes. I just have too much, too much stuff. You know, I talked about the horror it would be for me if I left my iPad at home, but if I can't find it on here, I'm just, you know. Um, the, the main verb in this whole clause is verse 11, you were circumcised. And then everything else is modifying that. Um, what, kind of, what is that circumcision? Well, is it physical circumcision? How we know, yeah, it's without hands. It's performed without hands. Um, what what is its meaning from verse eleven? It's the removal of what? It's not something physical. Yeah, the the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Um, Paul's theology of the body is not that the body itself is sinful. The body is neutral. You, you can do good with the body or you can do evil with the body. The body's an instrument. It's like Paul in Romans chapter 6. He, he says you either use your bodies or as instruments of righteousness or instruments of, of unrighteousness. So the body's neutral. It's not the, the Gnostic idea. And the body is also um, to be used to glorify God. The, the body is not something that's just throwaway because God will raise this body. It'll be a new body, but it will be this body. It's new, but different. Um, and it will be a body suited for the environment of eternity. So God's not against the body. And we talked about, you know, later he's going to say people who are uh, um, defrauding, uh, uh, delighting in, in humility and the worship of angels. And then, then at the end of the chapter, these rules don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. That's asceticism. And verse 23, they have appearance of wisdom, self-made religion, severe treatment of what? In verse 23, the body, yeah. It was thought like you climb so many steps on your knees and, and all of that. Um, yet the body is created for God. It's to be used for God. Um, the, strangely, an, another aspect of the 
false teaching is that the body is just is not God will just destroy the body, so it doesn't matter what you do in the body. The Corinthians had some of the Corinthians had that idea. It doesn't matter what you do in the body; it doesn't harm the soul. And there apparently were Christian men in Corinth in the Corinthian church who were going to prostitutes, and they weren't covering it up. And maybe they're even talking about it when the church gathered. And Paul said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy of Holies? Therefore, at the end of 1 Corinthians 6, glorify God in your body. So um, the body is valuable to God. Uh, it's not just a prison house of the soul. I probably told you this before. You remember the Heaven's Gate cult? Uh, out when they um, killed themselves, they were waiting on something or someone. I can't remember. But but um, their website stayed up for a while after that, and somehow or another, I guess they got on the news, and I got to their website. And they had a statement on their website that said that um, the body is like, a milk carton is to milk. Now, if you drink milk, do you save the milk cartons because of their inherent value? You may save them, use them for different things, you know, but why, why do you buy a, a milk that's in a carton? Because it comes in the carton. It's the container. You Are you buying a container? I, I need something to store some stuff in. I guess I'm going to have to buy this gallon of milk and pour it out. You know, you're, you're buying the milk and the container's just incidental. And so that's what they're saying about the body. It's just a shell. It's a, a prison house of the soul. So it's the removal of the body of, of flesh, verse 11, by the circumcision of Christ. So uh, Christ, this is not something we're performing on ourself. It, we submit to this. So in verse 11, the main verb is you were circumcised, and then he describes that. It's performed without hands. It's the removal of, of the body of flesh. It is something that happens to us. It's a spiritual circumcision. A cutting away. And then verse 12, baptism is related to that as, as well. Uh, baptism seems to be that spiritual <coughs> circumcision. <clears throat> and in baptism, so you, we die, and then you were raised with him through faith and the working of God. And Paul deals with this more in, in Ephesians, but the power that raised Christ from the dead, and, and he was raised from the dead bodily. It's, it's not... Uh, I'm sure you know that a lot of people who call themselves New Testament scholars today don't, don't believe really in the New Testament. There are New Testament scholars in the greater religious world who will say, no, nah, I don't believe Christ. I, and one even said, John Dominic Croissant, he said the body of Jesus was just thrown into a ditch. He wasn't raised. And then you might ask him, well, do you believe in, in the resurrection of Jesus? And he had answered, I believe that the early church believed in the resurrection of Jesus. And that it was just, it's just an idea, the resurrection idea, the resurrection faith. He wasn't, he wasn't really raised. And, and that goes against you know, what Paul says. It's not better to believe that. He, he's either raised or he's not raised. Um, so he was raised bodily from the dead. Now, um, think of that. Somebody dead and they're raised. <clears throat> that same power, Paul says, and, he, and again, he goes into greater detail in Ephesians. That same power raised us from spiritual death. That's the resurrection power that's there. And so it, that's why he mentions here at the end of verse 12, who raised him from the dead. 
And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and circum uncircumcision of your flesh, uncircumcision is the opposite of circumcision, of course. He made you alive. That's saying you're raised together with him. And so what's another way of putting that? He's forgiven us. <clears throat> Any other thoughts, comments on, on those verses before we look at verses 14 and 15? So, how from this passage, how does he understand baptism then? Yeah, it is this... If, if circumcised is the main verb, verse 11, and it's not a physical circumcision, it's a spiritual circumcision, it is uh, this removal of the old person, and you have been buried with him in baptism, it's, it's uh, the way that happens. It's related uh, to that, and it's related to faith as well. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 3. Somebody read verse 26, 27, please. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Okay, so verse 26 is a statement. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And for Paul... Faith is a comprehensive term. <clears throat> to have saving faith, you have to know about the person you're putting faith in. You have to mentally agree with what you know about that person. And you have to trust. Jesus says in John 14, 1, to his apostles, you believe, and, and there's no difference in the Greek between the word believe and fa having faith. Um, it can be false faith, it can be false unbelief. It's the same word, believe or have faith. So he says, you believe in the Father. He tells his apostles. As Jewish men, do you think they believed in God the Father? Yeah, that's a statement. He says, he's making a statement. You believe in the Father. Believe also in me. And what's he saying? You trust God, the Father. Trust me. So Paul says that we are sons and daughters of God through faith. It's not faith in faith. It's the object of faith gives its meaning. It's faith in Christ Jesus. We believe that God did what he said he would do in Christ and that he died for our sins. And we trust him to do that. And then verse 27 is related to that. Why is it through faith in Christ Jesus? For or because... All of you were immersed into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. You've put on Christ. So there's the putting on of, of Christ. Now here in Colossians 2, you, he has the idea of burial. And, and that's also in Romans 6, as you probably know. And in Romans 6, he's not... He, in Romans 6, he's not preaching a, a sermon to people in the world who've never been baptized. He's reminding Christians of what their baptism means. And what it means is you died to sin. So if you died, you can't live in it any longer. That's the whole context of that. So having been back in Colossians 2, buried with him in baptism, you're raised up in the faith, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And he made us alive and he has forgiven us. Historically, forgiveness is at the cross. In an existential way, uh, that forgiveness does not come to me until I trust what God has done in Christ at the cross. But Christ doesn't keep offering himself. Historically, forgiveness is located at the cross. He died for our sins. So potentially, uh, the forgiveness potentially is there for every person. 
and we have to respond to that. Okay, thoughts or comments before we talk about 14 and 15? Okay, he further explains that forgiveness as verse 14, a canceling of this, uh, this translation, New American Standard, canceling the certificate of debt. You know, some translations have handwriting of ordinances. Um, it is a word that's used for handwriting. It's the, the word for certificate of debt here is a word that is used for IOU that you would sign. It has the word hand and writing in it, in the word. So you'd sign this, and what does the IOU mean? It means I owe you. I'm, I'm in debt to you. And so he canceled that out. He wiped that out. He wiped out this IOU. It consisted of decrees that are against us, which were hostile to us. Um, I may get some heat from this, but I don't think this is spelling out that this is that he is saying he nailed the law to the cross. That's not what this this verse says. The law it could be understood possibly as that because the law pronounced curse on those who didn't keep it. But he is saying all of us are in debt to God because of sin. Jewish people are in debt to God because they didn't keep the law. What about Gentile people? Do Gentiles get a free pass because they have the law? You remember what Paul said in Romans? Yeah, their conscience. And, and all people know that. I mean, you can't say, well, you know, we know... We start out at least knowing, um, and, and again, C.S. Lewis calls that the ought to. You know, where do people go? You, if you buy a ticket to to go to a ball game or something, and you get there, and and you buy a ticket that has a specific seat, A twenty one and twenty two, and you get there, and there's somebody sitting in A twenty one, twenty two. What are you gonna do? Go home? Well, I'll pay fifty dollars for these tickets, and uh, somebody's sitting there. What are you probably gonna do? Go talk to somebody and say, there's somebody sitting in our seat. That, that's the right thing. I mean, that's the just thing to do. So um, it, it's this sense of right and wrong. So it, it, what he's talking about that was nailed to the cross is this, this debt, this certificate of debt that we owed God. And... Uh, you know, in uh, what Jesus, what's called the Lord's Prayer that he teaches us to pray, you remember he says, forgive us what? Our debts. Yeah, use the word debt. And throughout the parables it's used, I mean, somebody owes like his tremendous debt. So sin is viewed as this debt to God. He's taken that out of the way. He canceled that. He wiped that out. Nailed it to the cross. Um, and, and this may play, I mean, it's may, you know, what they nailed to the actual physical cross of Christ, the accusations. He bore our shame. He may have that background in it. I don't know, but uh, it does have the background of a what of our you, of what we owe. Uh, I'm sure you know the song, It Is Well With My Soul. We're not going to sing it, but... Um, in verse 3, I think, expresses here what I'm trying to say. When the psalmist said, or the, the songwriter, and, and I'm sure you probably heard the background. Of the, I'm not going to give the whole background, but if you don't know the background, search it out. It's an interesting story. Horatio Spafford was a lawyer and lost his family. And You heard all that? I guess you probably have. <clears throat> it's a powerful song. I mean, it says, it, it is well with my soul and supposedly he wrote it a, a, around the actual place where the ship, uh, ship went down 
But anyway, verse 3 <clears throat> says, my sin, and then there's a comma. It's almost like this is just such a, a, a glorious thought that I, it, I have to just pause here. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. I mean, what's he going to say about his sin? My sin, and then he just says, Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, what I'm going to say. My sin, and then he says, not in part, not just part of it, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I think that expresses what this is, is saying here. It's my sin, not in part, but the whole, my indebtedness to God, my IOU to God is nailed to the cross. It's canceled out, this certificate of, of debt. That's like the potential for everybody's sin is nailed to the cross. Like you were saying, <coughs> the potential, because then we have to, we have our responsibility of going through the, the step there and what it is. Huh? Yeah. Yet it is yet it is there nailed to the cross, yet if we don't if we don't receive that, if we don't respond, then we bear our sin. Um, yet historically the atonement is there when he offered himself on that day. So <clears throat> when were my sins forgiven? My sins were forgiven when Christ died on the cross. That becomes real to me when I when I trust and obey the gospel, when I obey that, that good news by, by the circumcision, the spiritual circumcision, the, the baptism, immersion, this identification with him. So yeah, the potential is, is there, but it's, it's, a, it's an accomplished fact, but it's not accomplished for me until I respond to that. Any other thoughts or comments? Now, it's often preached and often said that, you know, the law was nailed to the cross. Again, that's not what this verse says. Um, and there's tension in this. I mean, I was never under Torah, under the law of Moses. Uh, in some ways, um, uh, Torah continues because of the teaching that's there. And Torah is a positive term. But... Nobody was ever justified by keeping law, and nobody ever will. Uh, Jesus says, don't think that I came to abolish, but to fulfill. And so he fills it full of meaning. In him, all of the requirements of that are, are fulfilled. And it may be some of the false teachers here you know, are saying, okay, well, you've got to do this. You've got to keep Sabbath day, festival, new moons, and all that. And so it's fulfilled in Christ, certainly. And, um, but um, there's a lot of, you know, we learn of what God loves and what God hates from the Hebrew Scriptures. It goes into a lot of detail, but it's all fulfilled full of Christ, in, in Christ. Okay, thoughts on that before we talk about the last verse in four min for four minutes. All right, so what he's talked about in a positive way is the forgiving work of Christ. It's affected those who respond in, to that. Now he talks about how this affects these rulers and authorities. So this is a negative for them. It's positive for those who are in debt to God because of sin and they trust in, in what Christ has done. It's negative for the rulers and authorities. These would be, I mean, the text doesn't say satanic or evil, but then that's the context, I think, of this. And the same thing happened at the cross. He made a public display of them. He shamed them. And he triumphed over them through either him or it, the, 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 or it. The, he, the Greek uh, can go either way. God seems to be the subject of doing this through Christ, but it may be that Christ did this 
on the cross in verse 15. So he did, he triumphed over them through it, that'd be a cross, or through him, that's through what Christ did at the cross. And so he defeated these rulers and authorities and he made a, he, stri he stripped them is the, <clears throat> the word, he disarmed them. And he made a public display and he triumphed over them. And the background of this is a Roman triumph. <clears throat> uh, Rome conquered the world. And so they'd go out and fight all these battles. And they'd bring, I mean, you know, if you're, if you, you're focused on military, you want people to know, okay, well, we got a real good military and you want people to see that. And you kind of want to build that up with, with great, uh, with great uh, pomp and circumstance. So they'd come back, I mean, sea battles, they'd come back and they'd flood the Colosseum and have boats out there and reenact some of those. Um, and then um, they'd come back from fighting in different places. So they come back and there's a thing called a Roman triumph that Paul would know about. And he talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 as well. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'm the one that's being led in the triumph. Christ is leading me. He, I'm a slave of Christ. But here he is saying Christ led these rulers and authorities in this triumph. So <clears throat> it was a big parade, like a, you know, a big parade, you know, when something, ticker tape parade or something. <clears throat> so they'd come back from a victory and they would lead, parade the slaves behind them. They'd have these carts filled with all the spoils that they took in battle. And what's going to happen to the slaves when they get to the final destination is they're going to kill them. And so it's defeat for them. And so it's, they would enact, reenact all this in drama. And so Paul has that as a background. What Christ did is he overcome what, and he did it in an ironical way through the cross because the cross is, is weakness. But at that weakness, God shows his greatest power in raising, that Christ died for our sins and he raises him from the dead. So it's, it's a very powerful picture that's here. And, and you can research on the internet a Roman triumph. I think, you know, they didn't paint their faces and it's a really dramatic thing. Well, Christ has overcome his enemies. All right, thoughts on that? <clears throat> okay, next week we will pick up with 216, which has a therefore, so there's a conclusion all that he's talked about up this point. Any comments, questions on any, uh, any of this? <clears throat> and we will, uh, we will eventually get caught up. We, are going, we will cover the material. Uh, I appreciate you being here, and, and as, I, as I mentioned last time, I, I do appreciate the elders and the opportunity to, to teach. I look forward to it every week and, <clears throat> and your interaction with this. Okay, anybody want to say anything? Thank you for being here. I'm going to give an opportunity for them. I'm, uh, uh, I'll email them. If you want to take them, you can take them. I won't see them. We're going to go over them. It'll be self-graded. Let's have a prayer real quick before we leave. Uh, dear Father, we bow before you with humility. And as we have thought about this wonderful passage, Father, what you have done in Christ, we are filled with thanksgiving. We're thankful, Father, for... Uh, the atoning death of Christ, and we know we did not deserve it, and we pray every day that we live that we will grow to appreciate more and more what was done for us at the cross. Um, we pray uh, we will live our lives in light of that, and we know it will be our song throughout eternity to praise you and the Lamb. Thank you for everyone who is here. We pray your blessings upon us and, sa and keep us safe, and uh, we pray that we uh, we'll serve you and we will uh, encourage each other. Go with us now and forgive us for our sins in Christ's name. Amen.